two and a half years ago, we had our first networking breakfast, and we had a taping of Dr. Dworkin. And many of you were here and came and saw him on a tape. And I never thought the day would come that he, we would have him here live, and it has come, and we're so thrilled. And I would like to introduce him. First, um, I'm just going to kind of read a little bit of his bio because it's so impressive. And, uh, but even more impressive is him in real life. <laughs> it's, I have had one of the most wonderful weeks just learning. Uh, everywhere we go, we've had Dr. Dworkin speak on Help Me Grow. And I have just learned so much of his vision and, and the brilliant model that he developed to help families. And I'm just so impressed. But Dr. Dworkin is a professor and the chair of the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Connecticut School of Medicine. And he is the physician in chief in Connecticut Children's Medical Center. And I am, a, I am sure that he must be an amazing professor because he is a great teacher. He received his bachelor's from Rutgers, his medical degree from John Hopkins, and he uh, did his residency at Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School in Boston. He is a prolific writer, and when I saw his first bio, I asked Joanna for his bio, she sent me a 49-page bio. <laughs> and I looked, there were 150 articles that he has written. He has also been an editor and is now an emeritus editor for several publications. He is um, a, uh, he's the developer of the Help Me Grow model, and he is now the director of the National Center for Help Me Grow. And just on a more personal note, he's one of the ver very most kindest, just very um, elegant individuals. And I feel like it has just been an honor to be with him and to be with Joanna and Elsa. Joanna is the program manager for the Help Me Grow, and Elsa is an administrator for the Help Me Grow program. So with that, I introduce Dr. Dworkin. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much, Barbara. I tend to wander a little bit, and I, well, I'll try not to do that with the cameras, but if you can't hear me for any reason, please let me know. So on behalf of Joanna and Elsa and myself, uh, we are so grateful to be here, and uh, we've just been overwhelmed by your hospitality. Uh, it, it has been an extraordinary visit for us. When we uh, deplaned within a very short period of time, we were brought to the Humanitarian Center in Salt Lake. And to say that we were inspired and humbled by all that we saw would be, frankly, an understatement. It's a bit daunting to see an activity of that magnitude and scope and then to be charged with coming to try to inspire people. It certainly puts what we are doing in some perspective. We are really pleased to be here. And uh, after that uh, very extraordinary and kind introduction, I was wishing that you would next see a videotape of me rather than to stand up live and speak to you. But I, I will do my best to even vaguely approach uh, Barbara's very laudatory and kind comments. This, for us, is a great visit because the networking breakfasts are really, well, let me put it this way. If the info line, what in Connecticut we call a child development info line, is the brains of Help Me Grow, the networking breakfasts are really the heart of Help Me Grow, and you are really what Help Me Grow is all about. Ultimately, Help Me Grow is all about making linkages. It's linking children and their families to programs and services, and it's promoting and creating linkages among the people who are providing services at the community level, those who are supporting families within the sectors of child health, early care and education, and family support, and uh, all of us who are working together to try to create a system in support of young children's healthy development. 
I know that you're familiar with Help Me Grow, so I'm not going to speak about the basic components, although we've already touched on two of them, actually, the centralized point of access uh, to behavioral and developmental services and the outreach to community providers, to child health providers that are so critically important. So I thought I would take advantage of your familiarity and also take advantage of Barbara affording me the privilege of just speaking with you, having a conversation with you, rather than giving a formal talk. I have no, well, that's not quite true. I was gonna say I have no notes, but I did jot down a few things while Barbara was speaking, but otherwise this is not prepared. So I'd much rather be spontaneous and try to, uh, engage you in a discussion, and I'm hopeful that you'll even have some questions or comments or concerns or rebuttals to anything that I say. I assure you that we leave a visit like this with much more knowledge and information and inspiration than we leave behind. So our interaction with you is just uh, extraordinarily important to us. So as I was thinking about this networking breakfast, it reminded me that one of our strategies as we travel around, or even in the early days as we began to formulate the program that ultimately became Help Me Grow, was to try to capture the critical concepts that are the underpinnings to what we do, try to capture these concepts in a way that we could best understand them, share them, and apply them to our work. So along the way, we have coined some terms, some of which I think we, we have made up, others of which we've begged, borrowed, or stolen, and adapted to our work. And now, they've really become integrated in all that we do. So let me give you three examples that don't directly relate to networking breakfasts and then give you three that do directly relate to networking breakfasts and hopefully will emphasize the richness of what is actually going on within this room this morning. So first, let me just give you some more general examples that relate to the overall Help Me Grow program or system or initiative. So the first relates to the process by which we promote the early detection of children at risk for developmental and behavioral problems. So we haven't completely invented the term developmental surveillance and screening. Child health surveillance had been a term that was used in Europe to capture the content of child health supervision services, so-called well child care. And we adapted the term their surveillance to specifically reflect the process of the early detection of children at risk for developmental and behavioral problems. And it ultimately has been linked to screening, the ages and stages questionnaire, which I know many, if not all of you, may well be familiar with, into this process that now is termed developmental surveillance and screening, the process of early detection that has now been endorsed and promoted by the American Academy of Pediatrics since at least 2006, although the origins for it go back even earlier. So we're really proud of our work in promoting this concept and the term developmental surveillance and screening has now come to reflect the process that we all do in partnership to promote this critical early detection of children who are at risk for developmental and behavioral problems and for whom linkage to the types of programs and services that you're associated with are so important. So that's example number one. Example number two is a term that I'm sure we've invented, and I don't even know if it's grammatically correct. So the term is demedicalization. And what do we mean by that? Well, if we look at what child health providers, and I've been a primary care pediatrician for a number of years, what we typically do when we're confronted with a child with concerning behavioral or perhaps even developmental issues, we tend to medicalize those concerns and refer those children on to the only resources that we are typically well familiar with. 
a neurologist, a child psychiatrist, a developmental behavioral pediatrician, which I also am. And in all honesty, for the majority of those, those children, those referrals may be helpful in excluding medical conditions, which are rarely the cause for these concerns, but they're not very helpful in ensuring the proper interventions to address the behavioral and developmental concerns that parents raise. There are a couple of other problems with these types of referrals. First and foremost, they're expensive. Secondly, they're often difficult to access. There's a waiting list off a waiting time to secure these services. And third, as I've already suggested, they don't bring about the intervention that will really make a difference to the child and to the family. So what we found with Help Me Grow is that when a system is implemented to promote early detection and to link children and families to the appropriate community-based programs and services that you represent, rather than, on average, 16% of these children and their families being referred on for further medical evaluation, only 4% are referred on for further medical evaluation. And the difference, the 12% difference, are instead referred on directly to the community-based services, early care and education, family support, that are most likely to make the critical difference. So this term demedicalization is one that we're promoting. It has implications not only for ensuring that children and families get the help that they need, but also it's an important concept from the standpoint of cost savings. And we know that whatever health care reform brings us over the next couple of years, it will demand that we take dollars out of the system. And here is a way for us to control and manage costs that is in the best interest of children and families. So demedicalization, the second term. The third term that I don't think we've invented at all, it's used in a variety of contexts, but I think we've emphasized its applicability to promoting children's healthy development. And that is really exemplified by what's going on here today, and that's cross-sector collaboration. So we know that everyone in this room shares a common vision, namely uh, our work in developing a system to promote children's optimal healthy development. And we also know to bring that about, it's imperative that we break down our silos and work across sectors. So Help Me Grow is all about a partnership among child health, early care and education, and family support services. And as a pediatrician, I know that while child health services are an extremely useful platform from which to do this work, on the front lines, the services that are made available through early care and education and family support are much more directly relevant to the task of supporting families and promoting children's optimal healthy development. So cross-sector collaboration is not a term that we invented. It's used to reference a variety of different partnerships. But what we have done is emphasized its critical importance in terms of promoting children's healthy development. So that's been our general strategy. We come up with these concepts, we give them a term, we promote the term, and hopefully it helps to inform our work in developing, replicating, help me grow systems. So let me be a little bit more specific in thinking about what we are doing this morning and uh, introduce three terms to you that I am making up. And let's see whether or not they're relevant to the work that we are doing together. So the first concept that I would suggest is the fallacy of familiarity. I won't ask you to define it, because I literally did make it up this morning. <laughs> so when we began thinking about this concept of networking breakfasts in Connecticut, we were far too limited in our thinking, and we made a faulty assumption. 
Our assumption was that by bringing people together who were responsible for the wide array of community-based programs and services in the early care and education sector, family support sector, and child health sector, that we would have a venue within which we could inform them about Help Me Grow, update them on Help Me Grow, answer questions about Help Me Grow, and promote their use of Help Me Grow. And that was true. That, in fact, has happened. But the faulty assumption we made was in assuming that the majority of people within the room knew each other and were familiar with each other's programs. And that was certainly not true in Connecticut. Now, that may be true in Utah, where everyone is so open and so friendly. But I doubt it, actually, even in Utah. So what we found was a, that a major function of networking breakfasts and bringing community-based programs and services together was overcoming this lack of familiarity, promoting familiarity, promoting cross-fertilization across programs and services, and developing all sorts of linkages that were occurring even without a formal or structured referral to Child Development Info Line and Help Me Grow. So when we talk about the number of linkages to community-based programs and services that Help Me Grow facilitates, we realize, and we're so happy to realize, that it's only the tip of the iceberg. For as you get to better know each other and get to know programs and services, and as you identify children who are in need of those programs and services, to the extent that you can directly make the linkage, we say, go for it. You don't need to involve another entity like Help Me Grow to make that linkage if you're confident and if the family is able to successfully navigate the linkage. So this familiarity that we assumed to be present wasn't present. Networking breakfasts wind up being a very powerful strategy to ensure familiarity and expand the strategies by which linkages occur. So the fallacy of familiarity. The second concept that I think has direct relevance to networking breakfasts and what you accomplish is what I will now call the fallacy of permanency. So what in the world do I mean by that? Well, another component of Help Me Grow is the outreach that we do to child health with child health providers and their practices. And we very commonly go out to practices to meet with child health providers through our EPIC program, Educating Practices in the Community, and both talk with them about the effective approaches to early detection, so-called developmental surveillance and screening, and what the Help Me Grow program has to offer in terms of enabling them to facilitate the appropriate linkage of children and families to community-based programs and services. And very often, our child health provider practices will hold up their loose leaf binder that includes a wide array of pamphlets or notes or descriptions of community-based programs and services. And our response to that, and we try to do this as politely and thoughtfully as possible, is that we're impressed by your recognition of the importance of community-based programs and services, but we suggestfully, we respectfully suggest that you toss out the loose leaf binder because it will create more frustration than it will problem solve. And the reason that we say that is, and you're all well aware of this, particularly those of you who are involved with community-based programs who survive year to year based on the resources or funding that you are able to amass, programs come and go. Their capacities change. Their eligibility requirements change. So the best of intentions in, to link a child and family 
with a program or service is often met with disappointment or even frustration because the program that previously would have well served the child and family's needs no longer exists, it doesn't have the capacity to accept a referral, it's changed its eligibility requirements. We've been so impressed in Help Me Grow with the critical importance of maintaining real time the capacity of a resource inventory and the need to capture up-to-date information on an almost daily basis about the specifics of the programs and services to which children and families are referred. I don't think this has been that well appreciated in the past and certainly I know as a child health provider I also uh, went through the process of trying to gather program information thinking that it would help me in the future. So again, the fallacy of permanency, programs aren't permanent with respect to even their existence, but certainly with respect to their capacity, their priorities, their eligibility requirements. And the work of maintaining an up-to-date resource inventory is another relatively underestimated yet critically important component of the Help Me Grow system. Third concept, and again, I'm making this up, so if it, if it doesn't make sense to you, please let me know. But the third concept that I'd like to suggest is, the you can see why I wrote these down, the bi-directionality of miscommunication. And what in the world could I mean by that? All right, well, let me tell you what I mean, but let me give you just a little bit of background. So we've been involved in promoting this concept of developmental surveillance and linking it to, develop, to developmental screening for the better part of three decades. 1988 was the first time that I stood before a committee of the American Academy of Pediatrics that had been a longtime advocate of developmental screening, that is administering screening tools as tests and scoring them and interpreting them and acting on them. And I stood before them, not to discredit the process of screening, it is critically important, but to instead suggest that it be more broadly incorporated within this process of surveillance and screening that also emphasize the importance of eliciting and attending to parents' opinions and concerns, performing skillful longitudinal observations of children, which by the way can be as if not more effectively done in a variety of your community-based settings than in the pediatrician's office, which may not reflect reality at all. Third, the importance of taking an informed history from parents that is asking about the acquisition of age-appropriate milestones. And the fourth critical component that we advocated for was when particularly concerns arise on, for a child's behavior or development, soliciting input from others who know the child, a home visitor, an early care and educational professional, a preschool teacher, a school teacher. Those were the components of surve developmental surveillance that we began to promote. In 2006, when the American Academy of Pediatrics published its policy statement on developmental surveillance and screening, and we were very glad that they got the title right, they captured most of the components of surveillance as I outlined them for you, with the exception of one. Nowhere in that policy statement will you read, when concerns arise, solicit input from others, particularly community-based providers, who have the opportunity to observe the child and know the child. So, was that simply an oversight? Or did it reflect a culture within the child health services sector, a culture that says communication reaching out cross-sector to early care and education providers, teachers, is really difficult and we don't have the time to do it, or perhaps does it even represent a lack of appreciation for the value of doing that? 
I can vouch for the logistical difficulties because I've been in a busy practice setting, dealing with children, for example, with school-related problems where it's critically important to speak with teachers. And I know that I can't make a spontaneous phone call to the school and hope to be able to reach a teacher any more than a teacher can make a spontaneous phone call to my office and hope to immediately reach me. So it does require a bit of logistics to make these connections work. But on the other hand, they're not all that challenging. It can be done. And the amount of information that can be shared in support of clarifying a child's needs and ensuring the proper linkage of the child to the appropriate program and service is enormous and incredibly valuable and important. But we have these misperceptions. So on the medical side, we perceive that we don't have the time, we won't be able to reach the community-based provider whom we are seeking to speak with, and we may not even be certain of the value of the information that we're seeking, or we may not know what questions to ask. On the flip side, those of you who are community-based providers may feel that you'll never be able to reach your child health provider because they're too busy, they won't be interested in your concerns, or they won't treat your information with the respect and the value that it deserves. Part of our education of child health providers and of community-based providers is to cut through these misperceptions to acknowledge that our lack of effective communication is, in fact, bi-directional. That is, it's the, it's re, it results from misperceptions on the part of each of the sectors, child health, early care and education, and family support. And we know that if we can cut through some of the logistical barriers, then we will be able to share information that will be incredibly useful in accomplishing our goals, that is the linkage of children and their families to programs and services. So to the extent that these networking breakfasts afford us the opportunity to bring together child health professionals, early care and education professionals, family support professionals, and others who are committed to system building in support of children's healthy development, I would suggest to you that we lessen the perils of the bi-directionality of miscommunication. So I hope by speaking to a couple of these concepts, it does increase your sense of the value of these networking breakfasts, the richness of the discussions that go on, and I hope that I've emphasized how important these activities are within the overall Help Me Grow system. So I'm happy to take any questions or comments or any further discussion that Barbara would like, but I want to thank you all so much for coming and thank you for affording us the opportunity to visit with you and meet with you. Again, I assure you, to the extent that we inspire you at all, that's great, but there should be no doubt as to the extent to which uh, you have inspired our efforts and uh, will uh, really inform our work as we return home and continue this extraordinary opportunity that we have to work with 16 states around the country uh, to replicate this program. So thank you all very much. Please. With so the, uh, the issues of HIPAA or FERPA and how do we share information, correct? Yes. So on the medical side, this is not nearly as much of a barrier as one would think because if any of us within the child health services sector are sharing information in the context of caring for the same children, we can do that. There's no special permission needed. Um, I I'm looking at Chuck to confirm that, but that is indeed true. And so it, it's often a perceived barrier. There 
are some restrictions with respect to the cross-sector communication, but really all that is required to allow that is parents' permission. Um, so that's how we get around it. We, any information is always shared with the full consent of the parent. Please. Great, so how are pediatricians informed about Help Me Grow, how to uh, access developmental surveillance? So we use a variety of strategies, uh, including uh, the big group sessions like in pediatric settings, our pediatric grand rounds, which are our more formal presentations. And we know the extent to which information shared in a big lecture format like that actually increases knowledge or changes behavior is pretty minimal. We know that. But on the other hand, all we are looking to do is to increase interest and in some level of familiarity. The process that we have used and that you are using here to bring this to the a child health provider setting is a variation of what industry does and is referred to as academic detailing. So what pharmaceutical companies have done for years, right, is to go out into the offices always armed with food and with information and in the old days not so much anymore with samples and try to educate and form around their products. We've adopted a variation on that theme in which we also go with food and with a brief message, it often can be no longer than 20 or 25 minutes, um, with tools, and we go into the practice setting, and we typically like to gather everyone, not just the pediatricians or the child health providers, including, for example, nurse practitioners, but the whole office staff, because the key person may in fact be uh, the uh, the receptionist, it could be anyone within the office, it's unpredictable. And what we do is, first of all, we deliver two critically important messages to the office. We are actually asking you to do less rather than more. Uh, we're gonna give you some tools that will enable you to do that. And number two, we're gonna make your job easier rather than harder. So if you make those two pronouncements right from the start and you come with food, you can often get a few minutes of at least attention. And then we talk about the process of surveillance and screening and we emphasize that we can make the job of child health providers so much easier by, for example, providing access to a tool like the Ages and Stages questionnaire uh, such that child health providers can fulfill expectations to perform developmental screening without actually having to do anything in the office other than receive the results of the ages and stages questionnaire screenings. And we talk about the process of surveillance and the key, the really key step of simply at every visit asking parents, do you have any questions or concerns about your child's learning, behaving, or developing? And then our second major point that we make in this very brief educational session is that if all we do is come out and teach you how to better identify or detect children who are at risk for developmental and behavioral problems, but we don't provide a mechanism whereby that child and family can be linked to a program and service, that early detection will certainly not be helpful to the child and family. In fact, I think you could argue that it's unethical because all you have done is raised parental anxiety and maybe even an element of parental guilt without providing a solution. So we talk about Help Me Grow, its effectiveness in linking children and families to programs and services. And in Connecticut, our refrain is 1-800-505-7000. Operators are standing by and ready to take your call. And it literally is that simple. Whether the child health provider, the practice, the parent, or anyone else makes the call. And we leave behind materials that emphasize those key points. We've done this throughout Connecticut, well more than 200 practices, pediatricians, family physicians, and we've measured the impact of this because we have to be able to show that a program like Help Me Grow, the investment people make in a program like Help Me Grow, does in fact make a difference. And we were able to demonstrate in a study that we published that we know that Help Me Grow works and it does change child health provider practice. We know this by reviewing medical 
medical records and showing that following the in-service education, following bringing developmental surveillance and screening, and Help Me Grow to practices, that a higher number of children are identified within the practice as being at risk for developmental and behavioral problems. And we also know that after we bring the in-service education to the practices, that their referral rates of children to Connecticut's child development info line and the Help Me Grow program increases. So we know that it is effective and it does work. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Please, David. Oh, good. Absolutely. Well, thank you for making all of those points. They're, they're so relevant to what we talked about from the standpoint of child health provider outreach. It also reminds me, you have such extraordinary assets here. I, I can't tell you from our very first uh, uh, beginning relationship building with Utah, and this was before Utah became a formal affiliate of the Help Me Grow National Center. We were we were just overwhelmed by the extraordinary leadership provided by Barbara and by Bill and by Robin and the extraordinary team that's been put together. Another just remarkable asset that you have here is Intermountain Health. And uh, as I said to David, it's a little bit daunting to stand up here and talk about system improvements and uh, measuring outcomes and using that data to inform our practice when in fact Intermountain is the national leader and the national model to which uh, we all aspire from the standpoint of system building in healthcare delivery. So it's a little daunting to stand up here, but you're, you've greatly reassured me by uh, validating some of the concepts. So thank you very much for that. Please. Well, the school systems, that's a great point, and we've even had some uh, discussion here about the opportunity in the Utah Valley to do just that. Uh, uh, yes, uh, it, let me address that at two different levels. First of all, one of the uh, great strengths and maybe the greatest asset of Help Me Grow in Connecticut the asset that has enabled it to uh, be a firm fixture within our state's biennial budget every year since 2002. And just as a little bit of an aside, Connecticut has the highest per capita income of any state in the country. It also, just so you don't think our job is easy, it also plays host to three of the 10 poorest cities of their size in the country. And in fact, Hartford, our state capital, where we work, the home of the Help Me Grow National Center, is the second poorest city of its size in the country behind Brownsville, Texas. So we are a state of incredible contrasts in income, in quality of life, in disparity, in gaps. And our state budget 
is directly dependent upon Wall Street because we are disproportionately influenced by the well-being of our southeasternmost county, Fairfield County, and how the Wall Street dollars are flowing. So we are at times the beneficiary of a state surplus. You are at present, which is great. At other times, we struggle under state deficits and uh, budget rescissions, which we are at the moment. We currently have, at last count, I believe it was a $78 million deficit. That was a couple of days ago, so I'm not quite sure what it is as we speak today. And yet, and we've been through many, many budget challenges every other year since 2002. I hardly need to point out the challenges that we all faced beginning around 2008. And yet, Help Me Grow ha has never really been challenged from the standpoint of losing our state support. One of the reasons for that is it's not a big ticket item. The total state budget in support of the Help Me Grow program in Connecticut, a state with a very similar population size to yours, about 3.4 million, we have uh, about 800 to 900,000 children. You have, a, you have a greater number of children, uh, I'm sure, than we do. Um, but the budget cost for Help Me Grow is less than $500,000 a year. Really remarkably inexpensive. But the reason for that is that it blends the administrative and more importantly, the financial resources of four state agencies and our statewide United Way. Our Department of Social Services, which is our Medicaid agency, our Department of Children and Families, our Child Protective Services agency, our uh, Department of Developmental Services, which is our early intervention agency, and our Department of Public Health, which is our Children with Special Health Care Needs Agency. And by the way, in Connecticut, Help Me Grow is a program of our Children's Trust Fund, our Child Abuse Prevention Agency, which up until recently was another freestanding state agency, but has now been incorporated under our Department of Social Services. Did I say the department's right? I missed the one that I wanted to make, the whole reason I'm making this point. I think I said public health twice. What I meant, to, what I wanted to leave for last was our Department of Education, and that's where I was going with these comments. So Child Development Info Line, which is our portal of entry to developmental and behavioral services, is our single portal of entry to preschools, uh, early intervention services, our birth to three program, which is operated by our De Department of Developmental Services, our preschool special education services, which are operated by our Department of Education, our school age special education services, which are typically accessed at the local level, but could be accessed through Child Development Info Line, as well as our Children with Special Health Care Needs Program, which as I mentioned, is uh, operated by our Department of Public Health. So we have these linkages across departments, including the Department of Education. So at the highest level, we are well integrated. And at the level of inventories, particularly preschool programs, including those operated by the school systems are included within the resource inventories, and certainly the critical school system contacts, uh, those who are responsible for linking children to preschool special education, school age special education, are included within the resource inventory. We think there's a greater opportunity to work together with school systems. We've been challenged in Hartford to work in full partnership with a uh, very challenged school system that has undergone any number of reincarnations over the years, including for a period of time being operated by a private for-profit group. That did not work very well. So we don't have experience in working directly with school systems as a major direct partner in the Help Me Grow system development, but that's not to say that school systems wouldn't be or shouldn't be, and we think there is some opportunity here perhaps to do that. Would you add anything to that, Joanna? Just the race to the top. Thank you. So the other issue here uh, is the opportunity to embed Help Me Grow 
within, within a variety of initiatives, and in fact it has been embedded within a number of initiatives that have been uh, developed at the federal level and are now being implemented at state level. So home visiting is an example. Uh, home visiting requires an infrastructure, Help Me Grow can be that infrastructure. On the education side, in the Department of Education, many states, including not including, well, not including Connecticut and not including Utah, thank you, um, have received Race to the Top grants, which are really focused on improving school systems with the hope of, in, of improving outcomes and using a variety of strategies to do that. Those states with whom we are partnering in replicating Help Me Grow who have received uh, Race to the Top uh, grants have incorporated Help Me Grow in many instances as part of their Race to the Top infrastructure. Yet another opportunity for partnership with the educational system. Thank you. Please. That's a great point. So school system personnel now using Help Me Grow to identify resources. And this is the point that we have made whenever we're asked what's the relationship between Help Me Grow and a wide array of other services focused on, and again, I'll refer to it most generically as children's healthy development. So for example, when home visiting was starting to gain momentum at the federal level and states were increasingly interested in securing federal dollars to expand their home visiting systems, um, we were asked, what, is there a relationship between home visiting and Help Me Grow? And our answer, without much hesitation, was, of course. And in fact, it's bi-directional. And think about it. It's very similar to your relationship. In fact, it's identical to your relationship to Help Me Grow here. On the one hand, we know that the Help Me Grow resource inventory needs to capture all of those services that can be brought to bear in promoting children's healthy development, including, to the extent that it exists, home visiting services. So home visiting is a critical component where it exists in, Help Me Grow, in the Help Me Grow resource inventory. But the flip side is that home visitors need to be able, in support of their clients, in support of the children and families that they're serving, need to be able to efficiently identify the programs and services that they can bring to bear in support of families. And as knowledgeable as, as they or you are in your local resources, none of us can possibly be knowledgeable enough to know where all the programs and services are. So, home visitors need access to a resource like Help Me Grow to identify the community-based programs and services to which they are attempting to link children and families. And the same holds true for virtually any, any program that we think about. So it's not surprising at all that there are these synergies. We just need to recognize them and, and operationalize them. Please. Well, there is um, there is now, as I mentioned, the policy statement to include developmental screening uh, within child health supervision services. The uh, accredit accreditation agencies like uh, uh, the uh, NCQA. Uh, my medical resources left. Uh, the National Committee on Quality Insurance, Assurance has, right, did I say that? Yes, out of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, IHI, has identified uh, performing developmental screening 
as a requirement for practices to be to reach a level of designation as a medical home. And by the way, that level of designation has direct implications for reimbursement. And a number of managed care plans have now built in not just reimbursement for developmental screening uh, as, a, as an incentive for child health providers, but have also built in requirements for developmental screening as one of the quality indicators that they require practitioners to submit. In fact, there was just very, re within the past couple of weeks, there was a threat that with Medicare uh, realignment that the code used for developmental screening was going to be dropped. And uh, this was really inadvertent. I don't think it was really intentional. But what was so impressive about this was the immediate nationwide response to legislators, the executive branch, and the extent to which that, uh, and I think it was really an error of omission, not commission, was uh, changed. And in fact, I just got an email a day or two ago uh, that said that 96110 has been re-established re within uh, the coding system that we use to bill uh, Medicaid, Medicaid. For us, Medicare is not as relevant to bill Medicaid. So all of that, I think, really speaks to uh, the encouragement of formal developmental screening tools being implemented. Uh, and, and it essentially, I, I would say, constitutes a requirement to do it without necessarily passing legislation per se. Well, thank you all very much for your attention and your participation.